guess we'll go ahead and get started. We'll let uh, Hannah go first. Hannah Carter, she is a first year grad student here at Eastern in Dr. Peter's lab. And she's gonna be talking to us about how surface mined landscapes have distinct bee communities and less diverse plant pollinator networks. So we'll go ahead and let you share your screen and you can take it away. All right, can you all see my screen? Okay, thank you. All right, so yeah, as introduced, my name is Hannah Carter. I'm in Dr. Peter's lab, and I'm gonna be uh, chatting to you a little bit about my RAU experience that was at Eastern in 2017. Um, it was a really transformative experience for me and it kind of encouraged me to continue my research at Eastern. So um, first and foremost, I just wanna thank um, all the RAU staff for their time and dedication to the program, uh, Dr. Peters for being my advisor during this program and also the National Science Foundation for funding it. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit and preface this presentation with some background information that might be known to some, but um, it's just good to know. So pollination is one of the most critical plant animal interactions that there is in ecology, uh, mostly because of it is important for the reproduction of vital plant communities. And it also increases productivity of agricultural crops. Um, there has been recent studies that have suggested that there is concern regarding the resilience of pollinator populations. And uh, recent studies suggest that there are several things such as environmental change, anthropogenic disturbance, which is what I'm focusing on. Uh, that's just human induced disturbance on a landscape, disease and virus, and um, just general um, health issues with dec declining populations. A little bit of background about um, my study area. Central Appalachia has historically been dominated by highly diverse mixed mesophytic forests. And this ecosystem, it hosts a remarkable level of uh, plant and animal endoism and also it's a biodiversity hotspot for the temperate forests in this area. Something that we see a lot in central Appalachia, especially in southeastern Kentucky, is the presence of surface mine sites. Uh, this is like a huge concern because it um, really changes the landscape and um, it completely eliminates mature forest and re replaces those with non-native grassland ecosystems. So surface mining, you can see the picture on the screen, um, it typically involves clearing the natural vegetation of the area, uh, completely takes out all of the topsoil and the subsoil layers. It removes all the sediment and it puts those into like adjacent valleys and also uh, streams. So it completely changes the ecology. So in summary, uh, I'm focusing on the effect of anthropogenic change on pollinators. And um, I'm focusing on this because there are very few studies that measures bee diversity and richness in Southeastern Kentucky specifically, um, but in the Appalachian region as a whole. So here is a here's a map that I produced, and it's just a heat map of all of the um, surface mine sites since 2000. Um, in, Central, in, in Central Appalachia alone, there are 5,700 kilometers of forest that have been removed, and 3,200 kilometers of streams that have been filled due to uh, mining initiatives. In Kentucky alone, uh, five. 500,074 acres have been surface mined 
And uh, since 2000, there have been 240 active mines, which is what you see here, um, that densely populate the southeastern areas of Kentucky. So my overall objective of this study was to understand how uh, bee diversity, bee species richness, bee abundance, and plant pollinator networks affect were influenced by surface mining and reclamation in southeastern Kentucky. And we split this up into three uh, questions that I'll uh, specify a little bit later in the presentation. So my field sites were located in six contiguous counties in southeastern Kentucky, uh, Laurel, Clay, Leslie, Perry, Knock, and Letcher, which are indicated there on the left. And um, we actually sampled due to accessibility sake at um, K through 12 school sites. Um, and these sites were located either in or on um, mined areas that had been reclaimed or they were in close proximity to. And I'll let you know how we um, categorize those on this slide. So, we had seven sites that were considered non-mined and we had four sites considered mined. And how we categorized those were, we um, used ArcGIS to put a shape file of all the active mines in Kentucky, and then um, had a GPS coordinate of each of the ideal locations that we were going to sample from. And we put a 500 meter buffer around each of those sites to see if um, a mine site had fallen within that buffer. And if so, we considered it a mine site. And if not, we, it was considered unmined. And so here is the map that sort of indicated that. Mine sites being red, non-mine sites being blue. So for my field methods, um, at each site, I would locate a plant crop that were flowering and pretty abundant. And then um, for each of those plant crops, I would do what's called a sweep net, which there's a graphic there in the center of the screen. And I would collect any pollinating insect that was hovering over the flower and had the potential to touch the reproductive parts of the plant. And so I did each flowering crop for 15 minutes and collected everything by sweep netting and um, put them into a plastic bag uh, or an ethanol tube to be further identified in the lab. So um, in the lab, we had to wash, rinse, dry, label, and identify each of the bee species and uh, this was a really interesting process, um, washing the bees, but uh, that was just to uh, get some of the pollen off and some of the debris off, just to um, be able to identify them more effectively because some of the identifying factors were quite uh, small. So if there was a pollen grain or something that was covering uh, an ID characteristic, um, just it was very difficult to do so. So that's why we did this process. So as a result, I collected in the 10 weeks, 188 total bee specimen, and they comprised 47 different bee species, and they were found foraging on 13 different flowering species, which all the flowering species were identified a couple of uh, slides back. So breaking up my objective into three parts, the first part being do field sites located on or in close proximity to reclaim surface mines have a higher number of flowering plants compared to sites without. And we found that there was a marginally significant difference between the number of plant species on our sites uh, based on the presence or absence of surface mines. Sites without mines nearby tended to have more flowering plants compared to sites that had uh, surface mines nearby. Objective two are 
or is bee species richness or bee abundance affected by the number of flowering plants um, on each field site? First, we'll look at species richness. Um, we found a total of 37 bee species on sites without mines and a total of 17 bee species on sites with mines. And this graph is um, the average, so uh, it doesn't super line up with what I'm saying, but um, the number of bee species at the sites that were, influ were influenced by the number of plant species, but not the presence or absence of mines. And we thought that maybe we saw this because influencing factors like proximity to forest, proximity to water, maybe not having um, ideal nesting locations, things like that could have affected this. And so that's why we don't see a direct um, effect for presence or absence of surface mines. Now uh, I'm looking at the abundance, a total number of 83 individuals of bees were found at sites without mines and, or with mines and a total of 104 bees were found at sites with mines, without mines. Bee abundance was significantly influenced by the number of plant species at each site, but not significantly affected by the presence or absence of mines and like species richness, some of those other factors could have caused um, this non-significant difference. And my third part of my objective was, do plant pollinator network properties differ between field sites that are located on or in close proximity to reclaimed surface mines compared to those without? Uh, first, I wanna talk about network properties a little bit, and I'm not gonna get into the nuances of this, but I'm gonna talk about just the general structure of plant pollinator networks. Um, so I'm gonna start on the right axis, which is these black bars right here. And so this axis represents the plant species that we saw at each site. And the left bar, bars represent um, the bee species that we saw at each site. The width of these black bars or the strength it, it's a visual representation of the abundance of that particular species. Um, likewise for the bee species on the, on the right. And then all the interactions in the middle here, they are the observed pollinating interaction. So that's when I actually collected the bee. Um, the intensity of the um, line here in between that just shows the abundance of that interaction. So the larger, like the strength of that, the larger the, um, the larger the line is going to be. So we can tell that there were a lot, of, in this example, we can tell that there are a lot of interactions between Apis mellifera and Trifolian repens um, compared to um, some of the other that have really narrow lines. So these were the plant pollinator networks that we constructed using R. And um, a few things that are pretty um, unique between the two are just the number of interactions, the evenness of interactions, and um, just seeing the strength of the interactions. So um, the figure on the left is the network that we constructed of surface mine sites. And on the right is the network that we constructed from non-surface mine sites. And these provide really interesting insight to the ecological differences that we can see um, that are greater than two trophic levels. And it just is a really nice way to visualize what's actually happening in the ecology uh, at each site. And so a few things that I wanna talk about specifically is the number of interactions 
was a lot lower in the surface mine sites compared to the mine sites, which you can distinctly see. The um, evenness of interactions was much greater in the, the non-surface mine sites. So there wasn't a dominant plant or pollinator species in the area that um, was sort of the only thing that you saw compared to the mine sites. So this is just a visual representation of all my results together. They, uh, this indicates the um, sites, the number of plant species, the bee abundance and the bee species richness for each of the sites, just visually, and um, a summary of the results that we found. And so in conclusion, we found that bee abundance and richness was significantly influenced by the number of plant species at each site. So the number of plant species act as a good predictor for both bee abundance and species richness, but um, presence or absence of surface mines wasn't a direct effect of the plant or for the um, bee abundance and bee species richness. And that might be because of other um, environmental factors such as the closeness to um, forest, to water, maybe not having the most ideal nesting habitat for bees. We also found that presence or absence of surface mines um, tended to have, uh, it did not directly affect bee abundance and species richness, but it but a trend toward the high number of bee species on sites without surface mines was observed in the data collected. So low floral diversity, low floral abundance and nesting habitat availability could contribute to the low numbers of bee species observed in the sites. So some future directions for this study are the questions here, are the bee communities different across field sites? Um, quantifying that. What about the sites cause the difference? And this is highlighted because um, this is similar to what I'm going to be doing for my thesis project. Uh, the next direction would be, how are the bee communities different across field sites? Which is very similar to the first question but this is thinking about more of like the physical characteristics that are different. What the ecosystem provides the best, what ecosystem provides the best pollination services? So what about the ecosystem is creating a very good environment for pollinators, pollination services? And how are the pollination services the same or different across sites? And that's just quantifying the previous question. So I am really excited to have the opportunity to sort of further this research with my thesis project. I'm not going to be specifically looking at um, mind restoration initiatives, but I'm just going to be looking at restoration pretty generally and going to be focusing on that second question here. What about sites? causes the difference between um, different uh, plant communities and also bee communities. And I'm gonna be doing that through focal species of bumblebees. And so it will be really rewarding to be able to continue this research um, in my master's program. And so that is all that I have today. And do you all have any questions? Thank you for that presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Anna, I have one question. First of all, great presentation, <clears throat> really excellent slides. On those reclaimed sites, the plants there, are those plants that were seeded in the reclamation process or those plants that came in from native seed banks? Right. Um, we did not have information on this, but it, um, looking at the literature, I would assume that 
most of which were from seed mixes that were just kind of typical in the reclamation process. A lot of them were non-native like legumes, mm -hmm. um, several of which were just clover, which is what you find in like the different varieties of seeds that, you know, you plant after reclamation. So um, I don't, I think, I don't think they were like naturalized. I think it was like the reclamation initiative specifically. Okay. And it seemed too from your, that one slide you had with those two bars that there was higher diversity of plants, obviously on the non-mined areas than on the mined area. Yes, this one here. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Hannah, I have uh, a couple questions. Uh, so first, regarding the methods, this is just kind of a personal question. Do you think that using the sweep nets, do you think that that influences the kind of interactions that you're actually capturing? I ask this because um, using that versus the cartridges, it just seems to be a little bit more aggressive. And, I, and I've always kind of wondered if that is like, you know, uh, other bees from coming to that area in the time and in the, in the amount of time that you're actually sampling. And I was just curious your thoughts. Yeah, um, that I think was certainly a downfall of this project um, because this methods, uh, these methods really focused on being there for no longer than like two hours. And so you were really only getting a snapshot of the interactions that were actually occurring and Furthermore, you were only really observing the interactions in a particular time. So like you might, if you didn't sample really early in the morning or late in the afternoon, you might be missing some diversity just because of like the phenology of um, the bee species for, you know, the time that you're sampling, but also like the, you know, the physical time. Um, certain species forage during different times of the day. But also like specifically for the methods, um, sweep netting only, you might only be catching a subset of the population that's actually in the area. Um, so like compared to methods such as like bee bowl collection or other traps, they might be more effective in trapping certain species that you um, might not come across because they're there throughout the entire like day where I was only sampling for a short period. Right, and I'm assuming bee bowls and such, those, I mean, you can't really tie that interaction to the actual plant species, right? Right. So that's why they're not used. Um, are you guys planning on doing like modular uh, analysis to kind of look at the structure of these uh, of these networks and how your focal species, like what role it may or may not play in that? Yeah, definitely. And um, to kind of remedy the question that you were talking about before, we plan to do um, we plan to do networks according to pollen load samples. So we're going to be using PCR and other lab techniques to uh, see what pollen that each particular species of bees is collecting. And so that just makes the database kind of more robust because instead of observing one single interaction, I'm going to be seeing all the interactions that um, take place between that particular bee and that particular pollinator or that particular plant because of the pollen that the bee is carrying. Um, so, hopefully I'll be able to see a little bit more um, like efficient network because um, I'm gonna be seeing like a more holistic view of the ecology. And um, hopefully, you know, I, this was only a 10 week project. So um, we didn't really get into the nuances of like modularity and stuff other than like what's directly like what you can see in the statistics so yeah I hope to get a little bit more in in the weeds so to speak for the um, statistics and the network analysis that's awesome I'm excited to see where that where that goes thank, thank you, you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, any other questions before we move on? All righty then. Thank you again, Hannah, for that presentation. Then next we will hear from Rennie, a second year grad student in uh, Richter's lab studying copperheads and chemosensory and how they hunt, use that to uh, find cicadas. So take it away, Rennie. All righty. <laughs> All right, can everybody see this before I start rambling? Good? Okay. Yes. Wonderful. All right. So, as Ted said, I was looking at chemosensory use by Agkistrodon contortrix, the eastern copperhead, during cicada predation. There we go. Okay, so just to give you some really quick background data, um, I was dealing with a subfamily of snakes known as Crotolinine. They are all venomous. And they are also known for having distinctive L'Oreal pits that allow them to detect infrared radiation, which you can see right there in this photo quite prominently. Um, with this subfamily, it pretty much composes all of the venomous snake species that are present in Kentucky, with one exception that is in a lapid. And they are super well known in terms of being studied for their ability to do chemosensory tracking in their predation activities. So as far as what the heck that is, um, essentially chemoreception is the collection of any sort of chemical particle um, within the environment by an organism that is then analyzed in some way, usually via saliva to help them identify and distinguish certain objects or animals of interest. Contextually with these guys, it's something they want to eat usually. Um, for the family of Viperidae, it is strongly linked to their predatory behaviors, almost to an intrinsic degree for most species. It's a factor that really helps their strategies for predation to have strong foraging success, as well as reduce the risk of them incurring any kind of bodily harm in the process. It also helps to compensate for any sensory disadvantage, disadvantages they experience in certain scenarios, um, nocturnal hunting being a really big one. It's super helpful during that. And that process occurs via vulnerable faction, which is quite simply Tip of the tongue is really great for collecting particles. So it goes out, kind of swabs the area of the environment right around the snake's head. Um, after that, the tongue is retracted and the tips are inserted into the vulnerable nasal organ at the top of the mouth. Particles are processed by various cells, turned into neural signals sent to the brain for processing. Any molecules of interest are then analyzed and basically selected for. And so at that point, when the tongue goes back out to do another sample, it can be used almost kind of like how we would use a metal detector. So they can sweep it side to side, bring it back in, and basically any direction they were able to find the particles they're trying to hone in on, they would continue going in that direction and essentially be able to make a rough path out of um, particle presence or absence. So with, Viver with Viperidae, you have two primary foraging strategies. Ambush predation, which usually involves a foraging coil, low energy, but also a lot less risk of getting eaten yourself in the process. And then active predation, where you expend a lot of energy, but you have a much better chance of getting a lot of energy. So chemosensory tracking is related to both of these. Um, the most well-studied one is strike-induced chemosensory searching, also known as SIX. That is an ambush predation strategy. Um, essentially, the critter goes into a foraging coil, waits till prey comes by, strikes it, envenomates it, then immediately releases it. After that, the prey item will skitter away Venom will do its work and the snake uses the molecules it 
gathered during the strike interaction to then track them down and eat its prey with relatively no risk to itself. This is a super, super well-studied process. Um, it's probably one of the most well-studied foraging processes for snakes in general. And depending on the family you're looking at, it can be super crucial too. So for crotalinine, it is incredibly important, especially if you go further down into genuses like crotalus for rattlesnakes, this is almost intrinsic to how they will eat just about anything. Um, and if this process gets interrupted, it, it, it will actually affect them to the point where they will actually just restart in a foraging coil again, instead of searching the area for their dead prey item. And so six is also a prey behavior or a foraging strategy that has been ascribed to copperheads in pretty much all of the literature about them. Um, but there are some issues with that. And so for active predation, we've got non-strike induced chemosensory searching. And in non-viperidae snakes, so basically anything non-venomous, um, this is pretty common and it is used to do foraging as well as playing a big role in finding and evaluating mates. So in 1996, they found um, non-strike induced chemosensory searching in the Viperidae family while studying prey interactions with cottonmouths at Kistrodon piscivorus. And this was done by Chizar. And basically, he's like the big guru of any kind of um, chemosensory related research with vipers. So this was something I think that he found very, very interesting, unusual, be because basically none of the other experiments he had did along the same line had had any outcomes like this before. And the way it worked basically was they had a maze and they would present a prey item to the snake they were studying at the time and they would either allow it to strike the prey item or not strike it. Afterwards, they would let it follow a predetermined scent trail in the maze. And with Apiscovorus, um, what happened was that even when they didn't strike a prey item, they would still effectively follow the chemical trails in the maze. And that was really, really cool. And so one of the first questions I think that came to his mind as well as any other researcher's mind in this context is, if you see this in one species of a genius, could it also be present in, in close relatives? So in 2002, Chizar and Catherine Stiles um, did a follow-up experiment with Agkistrodon contortrix to see if they also did this trail tracking behavior. They did not find any evidence of it whatsoever and found that just like in primary literature, A. contortrix was apparently reliant on envenomation just like many other um, crotolinine. And within that experiment, they also had for their trials um, the factor of cover presence also being really critical to having them actually successfully trail track. Usually that's an indication that you're using juveniles of a species, but I just found that something interesting um, that they included. And so there is one mention in literature aside from Chizar's study with Agkistrodon piscivorus of trail tracking. And that is by Fitch, who basically wrote the Bible for copperhead research. And um, he briefly mentions in one of the predation related chapters that they will do trail tracking in association with when they are predating specifically on cicades. And of course, one of the interesting things to note here is that with all the envenomation and trail tracking trials, no one has ever tried using cicadas as a prey item. It's almost always rodents or amphibians. So within the gorge, um, Eastern copperheads are pretty prevalent. And one of the things that has come to a lot of people's notice is that they will actively predate on cicadas during their seasonal emergence periods in the summer. 
And if you look at the right, you can kind of see as the copperhead is moving through the grass, um, it's constantly moving its head side to side as it's sampling the ground with its, with its tongue. That sort of movement is very much indicative of their tracking method definitely not being based off visual location of the prey item. The other cool thing is that them actively foraging just also doesn't match what literature says they should be doing in the wild. Uh, and the really wonderful thing about the research system we're using for this is that these copperheads will consistently return to our study site year after year and do these behaviors. And the thing I love about this too is that for my project, um, one of the things I've set out to do is basically, I'll get to that later. Um, so for our study site, it's located in the Red River Gorge. It's a campground that's frequently used by hikers as well as campers. So it has a lot of anthropogenic disturbances. It is characterized as a forest clearing with interspersed tree groves. That's where most of the action will happen in terms of the cicada emergences. And for our boundary, we would define it as about one meter past the foliage line of the main clearing or the edge of the parking lot as well. Our sampling would begin at dusk pretty much every night we were out there during the summer. For the general system methods, we would look for incoming copperheads each night while doing rounds. Um, we would stop our rounds after basically three rounds of finding no new copperheads. When we encountered an individual, we would scan them for a pit tag. Any individuals that we had not captured yet that year or were brand new and not tagged at all would be captured and brought back to our camp for processing in the morning. At that point, we would take basic health stats like weight, length, snout vent length, check for gravidness, all that good stuff. If they were individuals who were completely new captures, yours truly would also pit tag them. So far, I didn't have any complaints from them about how I did. And then afterwards, we would release them back into the forest, um, ideally discreetly, although sometimes that was more difficult than others. And of course, while we were also out there at night, we would be documenting cicada activity as well um, by collecting exuvia emergence or exuvia, um, which is basically just the shell they leave behind after they shed. And we'd also take various um, environmental statistics such as humidity, ground temperature, air temperature, and moon illumination each round we did during the night too. So anyways, getting back on track with the stuff I'm excited about. Um, with my research goals, one of the things I really set out to do was give a wild documentation of non-strike induced chemosensory searching by, by period A. And with Chizar's paper on Agkistrodon piscivorus, that was what he said would be the next main goal for this line of study is finding wild examples of these behaviors, which is what we've got. In addition to this, I really wanted to take a closer look at how effective their ability to use chemosensory trails was. And the way I chose to do this was try and disrupt, disrupt them with a 5% amyl acetate and DI water solution. Amyl acetate um, for context is a substance that is essentially like banana flavoring um, that has been shown in a lot of other studies, especially with garter snakes to have a natural version from Squamata. So I wanted to see how it would do with them. Uh, that being said, as I think anyone doing field work this summer has noticed, it had some irregularities. So one of the big things that impacted my studies were that cicadas begun their swarm emergences on July 4th, which was about a solid three weeks um, later than really when we expected them to come. When they did start emerging, the active cicada numbers per night were honestly very low. For us, finding one to two active cicada nymphs a night was quite good. And um, the numbers themselves weren't bad, but it was 
very difficult for us as well as the copperheads to find them. And for my research, I was initially relying on being able to film copperheads going through entrance to the site all the way to finding and eating a cicada, which turned out to be much more rare than we had expected for this summer. Another thing was my disruption trials got rained out a lot. Um, with the campground also opening at about the same time that the lockdown stopped, uh, anthropogenic disturbances were a bit of a factor as well, especially while filming sometimes. And of course, COVID always kept things interesting for us. So I had to revise my data collection and my goals partway through the season to compensate for these issues. I kept my main goal of establishing empirical evidence of wild trail tracking behavior by um, copperheads. I reworked my film design by essentially looking at tongue flick rates per minute between different behavioral categories. With that, I had basically a lot of behaviors and patterns that I documented a lot of which were previously described by Josh Hendricks. So I'm going to help to provide further evidence and documentation of all of those that he has previously talked about, as well as describe any unique behavioral activities and interactions that I was also able to come across while out there. So in terms of the data summary for my tongue flick counts, out of 306 minutes of footage, 282 minutes were usable from 23 different clips. I was able to get fairly accurate measurements of tongue flick rates per minute from each of those clips. Um, in total, I got footage of 12 unique individuals, which I think we had around 35 to 36 individuals this summer that came out there. So I captured about a third of the diversity of individuals within the field site. Um, I had seven main behavioral categories that I was able to document related to tongue flick activity. And when analyzing my footage, I basically just put each minute of tongue flick activity into one of the seven categories for analysis based off which activity was most prevalent within those 60 seconds. And so within my uh, wonderful behavioral category definitions, I've got the two top ones, ground movement and climbing, both being basically movement in a predatory context and just accounting for when they're on the ground versus climbing an, ob an object. I also have pauses and periscoping, which is anytime they cease any sort of horizontal movement for at least 15 seconds. Pauses being basically they're just looking around usually, whereas periscoping is a more unique behavior that um, Josh was able to start documenting and we're still kind of figuring out just what exactly it is. But it's very clearly denoted in comparison to a pause by the fact that when periscoping, they'll basically arch their head and neck up in a very, um, it, it looks like a periscope essentially. And it, it's a very interesting behavior because they essentially freeze for the whole duration um, and they do it quite frequently as well. Then I have two non-predatory behaviors in terms of just general tongue flick activity, which is feeding. You can't do much tongue flicking when your mouth is full. And then fighting, which was something that we had occur about four times while out there and was quite fun to see. Uh, and then I also had a category for post-strike um, movements as well, which was basically any activity that occurred within 15 minutes of them finishing consumption of a cicada, which according to literature, some researchers say there will be a spike in increased activity. Others say that there will be a depressed rate of activity for tongue flicks. So I wanted to see what would happen with that in general. I also had to make estimations for tongue flick rates based off previous um, samples from literature as well for each of these categories. For predatory movements in Viperidae with most strike-based activities, you're gonna see somewhere between 20 to 40 tongue flicks per minute. 
So I went with those estimates for my own data. For pauses, um, most resting estimates were usually five or less in other primary literature. I figured since we are out in nature and it seems like they're in an actively predatory context that I would bump it up by double and have it be less than 10. For feeding, once again, if your mouth is full, you shouldn't be tongue clicking. Biting, this wasn't really talked about at all in literature, but I made the estimate that if 20 is my minimum cutoff for predatory activity, then it should be less than 20 for a non-predatory activity. The same went for post strike as well. If it's not predatory, it should be under that 20 minute mark or 20 flick per minute mark. So in terms of my overall behavioral trial counts for each, each category, I got a pretty good distribution. Um, the rarest ones were feeding and fighting, which isn't surprising because those were behaviors that were just hard to track down due to the fact that we had few cicadas this season. And of course, we don't always know why copperheads are going to begin fighting anyways, although I was able to capture a few before they started. Um, in terms of my mean tongue flicks per minute within each of these categories, my estimates were pretty much spot on. So with ground movement and climbing movement, we had it above 20 in both categories. Pauses were below 10, and they were also both below 5 as well. So maybe I should have been a bit more conservative with that estimate. Um, feeding, we did have a bit of an increase over zero. And the main reason for that is the fact that with my minute snapshots of tongue flick measurements, any of those, they're going to have more than one behavior in it more often than not. And there is some inherent bias caused by that in terms of inflating some tongue flick values for certain categories. Um, for post strike and fighting, um, post strike was almost right on the line for being considered a predatory behavior in terms of tongue flicks per minute. And then fighting was a little bit below it. Um, and something I wanted to note is with the fighting, especially often that resulted from two copperheads tracking the same cicada and one beating the other to it. And usually when they did intersect with each other at where the first copperhead was eating the cicada that they were focusing on, the uh, second one was usually never very thrilled about it. So in terms of my data analysis, uh, it is still a work in progress, but so far the big thing I have is predatory versus non-predatory behavior. So I compared my predatory movements, ground movement, and climbing movements to fighting and post-strike tongue flick rates per minute. Um, with that, the variance was not homogeneous um, between them, so I had to account for that. However, the residuals were normal, which I was very pleasantly surprised about. So I ended up going with a Welch's ANOVA and a games HAL post hoc test for um, analysis. For the ANOVA, the p-value was smaller than 0 0.01, so it was very significant that there were differences between my categories. In terms of the differences, um, the only two that actually were found to be the same were post-strike and fighting. Everything else came out as being significantly different from one another with a significance of 0 0.02 at the most, which I believe was ground movement and climbing. But everything else was considered very, very different from one another, which is really cool. Uh, this shows, at least in my opinion, that our hypothesis that they are primarily doing predatory activities in here and tongue flicking as a part of that seems to be correct. I also wanted to look at pauses versus periscoping just because they do seem to be very different behaviors and see if tongue flick rate had any indicators on shedding light for that. Um, for this, the error was non, or for this, the data was non-normal, so I ran a Mann-Whitney U-test, um, and we got a p-value of 0 0.57. It is worth noting that because Mann-Whitney U can have trouble dealing with ties within this data, 
there were a lot of ties. So I will say the p-value is a bit on the fuzzy side in terms of how accurate it is. But I do think just looking at the error bars overall for standard error, um, it looks pretty evident that they were relatively similar to one another. So at least in the tongue, in the context of tongue flicking activity for pause and periscoping, they don't seem to be too different, which is interesting. Some other quick insights um, from my data that I've been able to figure out so far. For the ground and climbing tongue flick values, those were all in the same range of values from um, the predatory tongue flick rates in mazes of primary literature studies as well, which is really, really awesome considering we did this completely out in the wild and not set up in an artificial manner like they did. Um, even though periscoping and pauses seem to have similar tongue flick rates, they seem to be very, very different behaviors in terms of what they're visually doing within each behavior. Additionally, uh, we discovered that fighting can occur around feedings. And so the little clip on the right is the result of one of those feeding encounters I was talking about earlier. We also were able to um, see some strong evidence of variance between anthropogenic tolerances by certain individuals. So I had some snakes that I filmed that were very, very chill about people walking around near them, didn't mind very much at all. There were others like um, Brutus, who was our third largest copperhead, who would literally just scatter every time someone came within 15 feet. So um, this is all preliminary, but I just want to give a big shout out to my techs, Marnie and Jackson, as well as my REU student, Jordan. Thank you to Steven as well as Jesse for all their advice and help in getting me started this season and working through it, especially Steven for the fireside chats some nights that we had. Um, of course, thank you to the Forest Service as well as Thousand Trails because without them, we literally wouldn't be allowed to have access to our site as well as not have to pay to live there during the summer. A big thank you to also the huge group of volunteers I got from Kentucky Reptile Zoo, Eastern Kentucky University, and University of Kentucky. And of course, last but definitely not least, our mascot, Bunta, pictured on the right, who uh, was with us through thick and thin from the first night to the last night. Questions? Thank you, Rennie. And just like before, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and speak up. Hey, Rennie, I have a, a question. That was a really cool presentation and a lot of really awesome videos that you all took. Um, that was really cool to see. Um, I was just wondering, what what are some of the like bigger implications of the results that you found and um, how does this apply to the field at large? So, Oh, uh, that's always the fun question. In terms of basically foraging, foraging activities, one of the really big things here is that if you read any copperhead literature on their foraging activities, like 95% of what you read is going to say they are sit and wait predators. They only use envenomation based tactics and chemosensory searching within that context. Um, Whereas what we have happening in the site is the exact opposite. And so for any kind of management plan, it's really important to be able to know these things. Um, obviously the campsite itself has had a lot of interesting situations arise from the fact that they have campers basically in the same area that these guys are coming in and doing their thing. And you know, your average camper when they hear there's a venomous snake that's going to be running around my tent all night. Don't walk without shoes or anything like that. If you don't tell them, they're going to find out the hard way. And that's, that's a problem for everybody. And being able to just describe these behaviors as well as getting at something that hasn't really been addressed very well with them in terms of what's been studied. And that's also just in general, an awesome thing to contribute towards general knowledge. Great, thank you. Yeah, that was a really cool presentation. I learned a lot. 
Renny, I had a quick question about your uh, ethogram. For your stuff that you're calling post-strike behavior, is that basically anything and everything they did for the 15 minutes afterwards, regardless of what the behavior was? And then the follow-up is, I don't know if you can address this or not, what, what specific kinds of behaviors were you predominantly seeing in that post-strike period? So with that, um, when I was analyzing the clips, Technically, I had some ground movement, some climbing movements, as well as some fighting in there. With the fighting, I chose to remove that and put that into its own category instead because I felt that made more sense contextually because they were very different behaviors compared to one another. Um, so at least in terms of the analysis, it was composed purely of ground and climbing movement um, for the post-strike activity. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Hey, Renny, as far as like the campsite goes and, and um, kind of educating campers and, and the people that run the campground, um, would it be logical to then say, if we have a lot of in, uh, cicada emergencies occurring one summer that it might be best to sort of avoid some campgrounds or what would you advise with that? Or do you think it's significant? I mean, I, I would definitely say no, because with any of these sites, I mean, we are the people who are visiting there. And I mean, the fact of the matter is like walking around these guys the whole summer, you know, we frighten them a bit, but they really don't care that we're there in the sense of it disrupting their general activities. Like the amount of people on the campsite in no way affected the number of copperheads that would turn out per night. Um, in terms of camper safety, that might be a good thing to consider, but it, I think especially with what we saw while out there it is also totally within reason to say that as long as people take the proper precautions, they should be totally fine out there even with these guys running around. As long as you don't choose to go in the long grass, um, just like in the second Jurassic Park movie, you'll be good. Okay, awesome, thanks. Any more questions for Rainy? All right, thank you for that presentation, Rainy. Hey. Then, uh, so next we 